Detroit filming a love scene. They were fully clothed, but they were lying down. And this was unheard of in American films. Father and Garbo got so carried away that Clarence Brown said, we just turned off the lights, moved the camera away, and tiptoed off to another part of the sound stage until they got it out of their system, and then we went on shooting. <laughs> It was very titillating to have a great lover, but American lover. And then here was this mysterious woman who came from who knew quite where. It was just extraordinary, the electricity between these two. She was always going to be made palatable for an American public. So she wasn't just pure evil, the way the classic vamp was. She was like the whore you could take home to mother. Staged for the cameras, tests revealed that the Garbo-Gilbert phenomenon quite literally set pulses racing, particularly among female fans. One of the things that was vital to Garbo was the amount of help that she received from my father. She would look over to where he was standing and check out this or this, and he would nod and then she would do what he was suggesting. It's been said that Garbo had a love affair with the camera, but she knew exactly what she was doing. She'd find the key light, and uh, she would turn her head in, into that light, and that light liked her. The lighting was very straight on, a little above her head, into her eyes, no real tricks. She had the strength to be able to sit just with one close-up and just and play the scene out. She didn't have to use any tricks. She was not the carbon copy of a so-called movie star. She would come to the studio by 8.30. She was completely made up. She made herself up at home, drive right up to the stage, go into her dressing room, be out five minutes to nine, ready to work. On the set, she was very unpretentious, but she didn't make personal friends with the other actors. Her keeping to herself was legendary. This extended to a reluctance to be watched performing, even by the cast and crew. Garbo wanted a closed set, unheard of at that time. She could not function if people were watching her. And John was very aware of this. She was not in a position at that point in the hierarchy to demand a closed set, so he simply did it for himself. And he got blasted for it in public that John Gilbert is making all these demands, but it wasn't for him, it was for her. She didn't want us meet my eyes when she was trying to act. And I was pretty nervous about that. I had a line and I walked away and turned back, you know. And she said, don't look at me. <laughs> so I had to go off and keep my back to her. <laughs> By 1927, Garbo and Gilbert were Hollywood's hottest couple. The wave of publicity surrounding the romance bore them up into their next on-screen pairing, an adaptation of Anna Karenina. MGM head of production Irving Falberg was determined to make the most of the love affair while it lasted. And what makes that movie so special is the fact that Gilbert and Garbo were truly in love. Uh, their passion was fresh, they were delighting in each other, they laughed together. It's a happy picture. And you can see why Thalberg wanted to call it love, because that's what it was all about. It just pours through the screen.
In spite of her on-screen success, Garbo was increasingly uncomfortable with the demands made on her. She turned to Gilbert for advice on how to play the studio system and win a more favorable deal from Mayer. My father encouraged Garbo to stall on her contract because they were paying her very, very little. And by this time, her pictures were bringing in large sums of money. And he said, you just, just don't go. And finally, in absolute despair, Mayer gave in. Garbo had merely offered to return to the relative freedom of filmmaking in Sweden in response to Mayer's threats. She cared little for the Hollywood lifestyle and was seldom seen out, even in Gilbert's company. She had no interest in star trappings of dress, of automobiles, of luxury, of service. That was just not her scene at all. She had this glacial reserve that had to be preserved, or I think she was afraid of losing her identity. She had a great longing for freedom. There is a story of father going to look for her. He didn't know where she was, and he went down to the beach and drove and drove and drove out past Malibu, where there's stretches of wide open sand. And he found her car, and he parked his car beside hers and stood on the cliff and looked down. And there she was, standing on the shore, up to her ankles in the water, just looking out to sea. And he said afterwards that she was so at peace. And he could see that it meant so much to her to have this time by herself with the sea that he, he just got back in his car and drove home. He brought something out in her that no one had seen yet. She was more friendly. She was, uh, he would have gatherings on weekends, have people over for tennis or brunch. And she played the hostess. Nobody thought of her as being an ice queen during the first year or so of their relationship. What his friends became confounded with later was how easily, once she decided the relationship was over, that she was able to walk away from that. I do believe that there was deep love in her heart for him, but I think that her integrity or some kind of core of resistance or frozen assets, if you want to call it, something in there that she could not yield. And he wanted to marry her so desperately. And finally, he asked her for the last time. And she said, no, why can't we just leave it the way it is? And that was more than he could bear. And he reacted with his usual violence and went off and married somebody else, you know. Gabba's next romance is limited to the screen, playing opposite Conrad Nagel in The Mysterious Lady. The last years of the 20s saw the Divine Woman, a woman of affairs, and wild orchids further enhance Garbo's screen siren appeal and usher out the days of the silent era. MGM had delayed casting Garbo in a talkie for as long as they could. Knowing Garbo's next film, Anna Christie, would be make or break, the studio made the most of her by now legendary reclusiveness. The tagline, Garbo Talks, not only did it refer, of course, to coming out of silent film, but because she was thought to be this re recluse who never talked to any, who didn't talk to the press, who didn't even want to talk to anybody. So that made it all the more sensational when she did. Hollywood was full of people whose careers had been completely thrown off the rails by the sound era. It was a roll of the dice, you know, maybe her voice would not have gone over it. As it turned out, it matched her persona perfectly. Give me a whiskey. Ginger it on the side. And don't be stingy, baby. Well, shall I serve it in a pail? I'll let things be down to the ground.
Gee, I needed that bad, all right, all right. With her accent serving to deepen the exotic image, MGM once again cast Garbo as the ultimate temptress in Matahari. Public taste for the Garbo Brandon mystery at an all-time high, MGM began to consciously play on her reclusive persona in films such as Grand Hotel. You must go now. I'm not going. You know I'm not going. Oh, please let me stay. But I want to be alone. That isn't true. You don't want to be alone. You were in despair just now. I can't leave you now. You, you mustn't cry anymore. You must forget. Let me stay just for a little while. Oh, please let me stay. For just a minute, then. Increasingly dissatisfied with the role she was offered, this time Garbo proved that she did indeed want to be alone and sailed for Sweden. With no word of when or even if she would return, Mayo was forced to broker a very special deal to entice her back. She had a secret deal with MGM and they had set up a production company for her called Canyon Productions. But uh, that was a deal that MGM didn't let their other actors know about for years. Other actors like Clark Gable were trying to get production deals with them and they never knew that Greta Garbo had one. Setting up the production deal as they did, which allowed her to make fewer and fewer films, was the only way of keeping her. And 1932, actually, it was her biggest year in terms of her box office status. A new contract in place, Garbo made a triumphant return in the role of Queen Christina. Based on the life of the 17th century Swedish queen, and with a screenplay by Garbo's closest female friend, Solke Virtel, it was her most controversial to date. Queen Christina was accused by history or in her own time of being a lesbian. And I think that what attracted Garbo to playing Queen Christina was that she fought against the morality of the time, of her time, which God knows was about five centuries ago. Uh, and I think that to portray a bisexual or somebody who gave off the aura of bisexuality, I think interested her. Morning, Eva. What are you doing up so early? I couldn't sleep. That means you're either happy or unhappy, which is it? Happy. I'm glad. And what makes you so happy? Oh, no reason. How wonderful to be happy for no reason. <laughs> Let's go for a sleigh ride. I can't now. Oh, why not? Ambassadors, treaties, councils. How boring. <laughs> but we'll go after whatever. Oh, you always say that. But at the end of the day, you're never free to go anywhere. You're surrounded by musty old papers and musty old men, and I can't get near you. Today, I'll dispose of them by sundown, I promise you. And we'll go away for two, three days in the country. Oh. She must have projected bisexuality of a kind. Let's face it, by now it's not a sin. But she obviously did project bisexuality. With the sort of message Garbo was sending out on screen, it was hardly surprising that she found herself the object of attention of female fans such as Mercedes de Acosta. Mercedes went to Hollywood with the explicit intention of meeting and seducing Greta Garbo. She had had a crush on her for ages. Mercedes had.